uh, is academic ethics on the basis of book five, the end of Cicero's On Moral End. So as of now, you've read this complete, this entire long, difficult, but important work of philosophy, so congratulations on that. But we have to figure out how it ends. We know, we know how it begins, and we know what happened in the middle, so how does it end, and where do we end up? And I want to get at what is the overall interpretation of that. Now, first of all, what is the, who is the addressee of the book? Brutus. Brutus, okay? Cicero is writing to his friend Brutus. What is the setting, and who are the characters in book five? Noah. It's set in the rooms of the academy. So it's set in Athens, that's true, and they're in the ruins of the academy. Actually, they do a sort of tourist thing, and they go around and see the sites and say, oh, here, here's Euripides' house, and here's where the peripatetics were, and here's the garden of Epicurus. All of this now lies in ruins because of a Roman siege of, of Greece, but they're sort of strolling around like we do, looking at a bunch of ruins and saying how how great it was. Okay, and Noah, who were the characters? Or, or anyone? Cicero is the... There's Cicero. There's Cicero, Cicero, and Cicero. <laughs> Three different Ciceros. There's Quintus, his brother. Lucius Cicero. Then there's the Cicero of the... Author. And then... Yes, Marcus Tullius. So there's the author, there's his cousin, his brother, and then there are some other people. Who, who, who else? Um, Titus Pomponius. Uh-huh. And uh, Marcus. The most important one. Marcus Piso. Piso, yes. Okay, now, can, can you or anybody else tell us something about the setup? Why these characters, what role they, they basically play in the ensuing dialogue? Just, just generally. Well, generally, in the beginning, they're uh, reminiscing about the sites that they've just previously seen of historical philosophical achievement where they took place, and they're marveling about how, you know, being able to see the locations of where people were doing philosophy has really given them a, a better perspective and, gen, and has given them new enthusiasm for philosophy once they've actually seen where these things have taken place and so forth. Okay, good. Yes, that, that's, that's the background and the setup. But then how does the book proceed? Who does um, most of the talking, and who answers and for what reason. Yeah. Isn't it, like, um, isn't the setup, like, Cicero's cousin um, is going to start, like, an education, like, philosophy, but he doesn't really know, like, what school of thought he wants to, like, subscribe to, and so there's going to be sort of, like, a, uh, or, like, Piso starts up and, like, adamantly tries to convince uh, Cicero's cousin to join his school of thought, and then it just ends up being like this, like uh, dialogue between like Piso and like Cicero himself, like Marcus Tullius Cicero, uh, right? On like what school he should join, right? Okay, and and what what school does Piso represent? Um, the, the academics get. Yeah. Well, the academics. The academics. Okay, and it, it's a bit complicated because the academic school goes through several phases, and he claims to be a representative of the so-called old academy, but the old academy comes after the new academy. Uh, and I'll explain how that is in due course. But just a couple of other details. What is the date that this one is set? Uh, the year 79, which is much earlier than the preceding two dialogues. Okay, good point. 79 BC is like 30 years almost before 
the settings of book one and two. Which, what were, what were the settings of book one and two? Like, where were they in general? If you don't remember the exact names of the places, that's fine. But where, what? Yeah, Cicero's house. Yeah, they, they, they were at a couple of his vacation houses in different places 30 years later when they're much older and we're going over this stuff still, debating about these schools still. But now, at the very end of this book, we go back in time to their sort of grad student days. We're actually just student days. This is like, these are, these are, these are undergrads deciding what they're going to major in, sort of, and having a debate about it. Okay, so all of those details are incredibly important for interpreting what's going on. Um, the fact that this is a bunch of rich Roman people now standing in the ruins of a Greek city that was destroyed eight years earlier by Sulla, a, a, you know, carrying out campaigns on behalf of the Roman Empire. And in a, in a way, there's a point here that it, the Romans have arrived. Philosophy has passed from the Greeks to the Romans now. And in fact, the, the, the entire thing ends, almost the very last thing that's said is, oh, good job translating those Greek ideas into, into Latin. Now we, can, now we can go on and do philosophy and sort of, we've, we've replaced the Greeks. They're gone. Their buildings don't even stand anymore. We're in charge. Okay, just like we do now, and we say we've translated this stuff into English now, so we don't need, nobody needs to learn Greek or Latin anymore, we'll just... We, we have a superior civilization and language, so we'll just conduct philosophy according to that. Um, <clears throat> now, the point about the old academy versus the new academy. So, Plato's academy, founded by Plato and headed originally by Speusippus and Xenocrates after Plato's death, um, if, if, if you look at Plato's dialogues, first of all, Plato was a pupil of Socrates. Socrates wrote nothing. He did his idea of doing philosophy, which you get together with people in person and you sit down and debate about the definitions of virtues. That's what philosophy is. Plato wrote these dialogues that depict characters debating about the definitions of virtues, but also other things in logic and physics and so forth, but doesn't present any dogmatic view of his own. They mostly end in perplexity and aphoria. Uh, but the earliest members of the academy did set up systems, theories of forms, and theories of the mathematical nature of reality and things like that. That's what Speusippus and Xenocrates did. And there was kind of a backlash against that with Arcesilaus, Carneades, and these people that said, we're founding the sort of new academy which is meant to go back to the original way of doing things, which was um, skeptical investigation of ideas like Socrates and like Plato, where you don't offer dogmatic conclusions, you just, you just um, question things. And later in this history, you have a revolt against the so-called new academy and its skeptical orientations, and in orientation towards a more dogmatic conception. It says, no, actually, there were some views that came through in academic writings, and here's the basis, at least, of an ethical system. And so this figure, Antiochus, presents a theory of kind of academic ethics that groups together academic ideas of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And it's Antiochus, who all of the characters in the dialogue of Book 5 have just been listening to a lecture that he gave. And then they walk off and do their tourist thing, and then they end up debating about these views. Now, it would be a trick question if I was to say, well, how does it end? Which school ends up winning in the end? I think that's not exactly clear. That's a matter for debate and interpretation, which is perhaps where Cicero wants us to end up. After all, he is an academic skeptic of some kind. The question is, how far does he lean towards the 
so-called old academy and how far does he lean towards the new academy? That is, how much does he end up with a skeptical view or how much does he accept on a basis of probabilism or whatever the uh, quasi-dogmatic views uh, of the uh, new academy, old academy. Okay, so again, I, here's, here's a map I showed you on day one that shows the locations of the different philosophical schools in Athens, and this is what, these are the areas they are walking through, and they walk out to this suburban location of the academy, very far out of town, but it's a nice shady spot where they can sit and have a philosophical conversation. Now, this conversation is structured by a consideration of a classification of philosophical schools offered by the academic skeptic Carneades, member of the New Academy. Uh, and so just to go through that for you, this diagram is in your book on page Roman numeral 24. This is, this is a plausible reconstruction of the diagram that they're considering. We take what the end is, like pleasure, freedom from pain, or the goods that are in accordance with nature, and then we look at whether the philosopher argues that one needs to succeed in achieving those things or merely attempt to achieve them. And then we look at some mixed views that combine those ends with morality. Okay, and so, for example, Aristippus is supposed to be someone who held the view that the goal of life is to succeed at achieving pleasures. The view that the goal of life is pleasure, but you can just attempt to get it and it doesn't matter if you actually achieve it, nobody holds. That seems to be an incoherent view. Similarly, nobody holds the view that the goal of life is freedom from pain, but if you don't manage to achieve that, that's okay so long as you tried. That view doesn't make any sense. Okay, but there might be a view that achieving freedom from pain is the goal of life, and that looks a lot like the view that Epicurus holds, although it's attributed to Hieronymus somebody about whom we know almost nothing uh, in this text. And finally, about the somewhat vague term natural goods, it said that Carneades supposedly holds that the attainment of the natural goods is the end, while the Stoics, since they have this non-consequentialist and stochastic approach to uh, ethics holds that the attempt to attain them is the goal of life, that is, choosing the appropriate intermediate actions and so forth, but whether you actually achieve the end or not is not, um, is, is, is to be chosen, they say, but isn't the goal, and so that is the Stoic, uh, held to be the Stoic view. Now, um, this gives us a way of classifying and thinking about a bunch of the schools that are mentioned in the work, and it also shows us the ensuing dialectical strategy that Cicero employs for disregarding several of these schools and then ending up pitting two of them against each other, the view of the Stoics and the so-called view of the old academy. And the crucial point that that happens is in sections 21 to 22. Here's what the text says. I'll just read it and comment on it. Now, I cannot lay out everything at once, so note for the present that pleasure must be excluded, since we're born for greater things, as I shall shortly explain. And one can pretty much say the same about freedom of pain. Okay? Therefore, the views about pleasure and freedom from pain, if that's all they're focused on, we can just eliminate them from the consideration. Now, nor need we look any further, uh, for any further arguments against Carneades' view. Any exposition of the supreme good that leaves out morality has no place in its theory for duty, virtue, or friendship. 
And so we can eliminate another one of the views. Moreover, the conjunction of morality with pleasure or lack of pain debases morality in attempting to embrace it. Our actions are being referred to two standards, one of which declares that the greatest good consists in being without evil, while the other concerns itself with the most frivolous part of our nature, that is, pleasure. That is to dull all the brilliance of morality, if not to defile it, says Cicero. So then there remain the Stoics, who, so says Piso, borrowed everything from the peripatetics, peripatetics meaning Aristotelians, and the academics, and reached the same conclusions using a different terminology. So I'll give you a simplified version of Carnady's classification, emphasizing the views that we've discussed in this class. So again, no one holds the view that pleasure is the end and all you have to do is attempt to get it, and even if you end up in a painful, horrible condition, you still succeeded somehow, and nobody holds that view for uh, freedom of pain. Um, but the Stoics do seem to hold the view that the attempt to gain natural goods, which they essentially define as moral things, virtues, that that is um, a viable account of the end. Now, Aristippus holds that actually attaining pleasure is the end, and Epicurus holds that actually attaining freedom from pain is the end. And it's the so-called old academics, whose views we're going to discuss at greatest length in this book, that hold that it's the actual attainment of natural goods, not the mere attempt to obtain them, that is uh, the end. And the procedure we just went through with Cicero said, eliminate everything in the first column, because pleasure is not a suitable thing. We're, we're, we're talking about high-minded stuff like morality uh, here, and that would debase that talk to even bring pleasure into it. Same thing from, with freedom of, from pain. And so that leaves us essentially with a showdown between the two by this process of elimination, these two schools, the Stoics versus the old academy view. So which one of those theories is the better theory is what Cicero's aiming at. Okay, so let's see, try to figure out where he ends up. Well, first of all, Piso gives a very long speech um, and I'll try as briefly as possible to summarize, I think, the essence of the argument that he makes about natural goods in that speech, although there's a, a many, many important things he touches on. So he presents this peripatetic view about the relationship between natural kinds, the capabilities that these natural kinds have, and the natural goods that apply to them. So plants have natural goods. That is, we can distinguish between a plant that's withering and dying on the vine and one that's flourishing, fructifying, throwing out shoots and flowers and so forth on the basis of its vegetation, growth, reproduction, and so on. Plants, of course, aren't capable of sensation or self-motion or reason so we don't apply any of those standards to figure out if a plant is doing well. <clears throat> Animals, on the other hand, we involve, we look at both how their vegetative growth and reproductive capabilities are working. Those are certainly necessary for them to say that they're doing well and flourishing, but it's not sufficient. An animal that had all of the goods associated with these kind of capabilities, but didn't have goods associated with sensation, self-movement, the ability to experience pleasure, avoid pain, we would not say is doing well and has not attained its end. So we require that to say that an animal is flourishing, that it have goods of both of those categories. And then when we talk about humans, of course, humans also have vegetative 
and reproductive capabilities that are important for their flourishing and their sensation, self-movement, pleasure and pain and so forth, all of that, there are goods related to those things, but in addition, goods related to the use of language, reason, judgment, intellectual virtue, and so forth. Goods that we do not think apply to animals or plants. And the peripatetic view is that there are goods relative to each of these categories, that human nature involves all of these things, and thus goods from each of those categories are necessary for flourishing, and having goods from all of the categories are sufficient for flourishing. And the criticism seems to be that the Stoics somehow ignore these basic aspects of human nature and obsess obsessively focus only on goods in this category and in fact refuse to call the other things goods. They say that goods apply here and evils correspond to the lack of things here, but these things in the other category are indifference, at best preferred or dispreferred. And so Piso's argument is that which one of these views makes more sense? The one that embraces all of human nature or the one that for some reason fixates simply on the rational capability? And his speech ends like this, section 74, um, even the very proponents of hedonism themselves resort to contortions and have virtue constantly on their lips. They declare that pleasure is only desired initially. Subsequently, habit creates a kind of second nature which drives people to do many things that do not include seeking pleasure. So again, this is the basis for us eliminating hedonistic views, including that that focuses on pleasure and the one that focuses on freedom from pain. So what remains is the Stoics, but the Stoics have transferred not one or other small part of our philosophy over to themselves, but the whole of it. Thieves generally change the labels on the items they've taken, so the Stoics have changed the names that stand for the actual things in order to treat our views as their own. It is therefore our system alone which is worthy of the student of the liberal arts, worthy of the learned and distinguished, worthy of princes and kings. This is all of you, you know, which of you is, 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 is worthy of you princes. Um, <clears throat> okay, so again, looking at this diagram, the idea is that um, the Stoics recognize that all of these things are good, they just start changing the names. They say only use the term good in this category and use the term preferred, preferred and different for this. And so they change the labels on the things, but the philosophy ends up amounting to the same thing. So they may as well just admit, just go back to the old fashioned way of talking about this. Let's not try to revise our language and instead of saying, oh, that's a good that's a good thing, saying, oh, you've achieved a preferred indifferent, or something like that. We can just, we can just avoid all of that by going back to this old-fashioned uh, ethical system. Okay, let me pause for questions there before we see where the argument goes from that point. Any comments, questions? Yeah? I'm kind of confused on how you can say something can be preferred versus achieving. No, it's, it, it's not that it's preferred for achieving happiness, because the only thing that matters for happiness is goods, and the only goods are virtues in the Stoic view. Now, if you ask me, would I prefer to be poor or wealthy, ugly or beautiful, diseased or healthy, then I'll tell you, of course I prefer health. But I want to make sure that you don't get confused and think that by saying I prefer health, that I think health is a good thing, such that I couldn't be happy if I didn't have it. So if I had other goods and was happy, but then I suddenly didn't have health because I fell ill from an accident or, or from getting some kind of disease, 
then if health really was a good thing and suddenly I didn't have that good, then I wouldn't be happy anymore. So I, as a Stoic, don't apply the term good to those things that actually aren't relevant to whether I'm happy in the philosophical sense, successful, prosperous in the philosophical sense, in part because otherwise I make myself and all other wise people vulnerable to things that are outside of my control. It's not up to me whether I get hit by a falling crane when I walk out of this building or I contract a painful disease because um, uh, that I, from, from interacting with some other people or something. That's not up to me. And so I don't want to. I don't want to have a theory that says I can. I can end up being a bad person or not the most successful possible person if I don't have those things. So I've isolated my entire value system from anything that I can't control. Okay, it's still hard to control the things that I have isolated it down to, but I'm no longer vulnerable to those other things. Whereas this peripatetic system is completely vulnerable to all of these. So if you didn't have a good birth, you had a lot of congenital defects, you're impotent, you have a growth disorder, you're blind, you're paralyzed, so you can't move yourself around in, in space, you experience a lot of pain, and you don't have any pleasure, then they're not going to say you're, no matter how wise and virtuous you are, they are going to say that's a successful life. Right? They're going to have to say that that, that person is, is actually miserable. Right? Or, or, well, they were a virtuous person, but it ended up being a really ha unhappy, unfortunate life. Okay, so do you see, do you see what's, why one would want to use this to switch the language from talking about goods to talking about preferred and dispreferred? And again, they aren't, they aren't preferred in the sense that they're preferred because they contribute to happiness. Like, if you, have, you know, if you have virtue, then you can be even happier if you have wealth and health as well. It's just that we, it's a description of the fact that we have a natural impulse towards one and away from the other. But it's not crucial to our concept of overall success and happiness because that is exclusively focused on the nature that we become at age 7 or 14 when we're rational and reasonable and that, and that that's what we care about preserving. Is that, yeah. is that good? Okay, any other questions before we see where the, the dialectic goes from there? Uh, yeah? I'm just wondering that wisdom is considered as a part of virtue? Yes. Uh, no, not, a, well, that's an odd way to put the question. For the Stoics, it's considered the whole of virtue. Yeah, because one of the criticisms that I, I read in the text was very interesting. I wanted to mention it that it says that poverty is evil. And then if you see a beggar and then he is wise, do you think that you know it is right? Right. So poverty can't be evil because there you could you could find somebody that's poor but very wise. Yeah. So how could poverty be an evil if this good person who's better than a lot of these rich people mm -hmm. who are scoundrels and horrible um, people with wasted lives, mm -hmm. they're not better just because they're richer. And if we start recognizing letting wealth and beauty and so forth be considered goods and that one could be happy on those bases, then we're going to start weighing these against each other and say, well, you know, he's kind of stupid and, and, you know, unjust and mean towards his friends and so forth, but he's really rich and he's really good looking and he has a, has a really nice house and a great status and he's got a lot of fame and people think he's really great. And then we'll say that that person is happier than somebody that's actually a virtuous wise person who doesn't happen to have those other goods. And the first guy may have gotten all of those things by, you know, as people usually do, inheriting them, right? It has nothing to do with what they themselves do. It's what, you know, their parents gave them, those genes, those, that, uh, that wealth, that um, status, and so on. Okay, so here is then 
the dialogue that happens after that speech is given, okay? So, um, Lucius, who they're trying to win over, he's the sort of guy you've got to convince, um, says, I'm completely won over, and I think my cousin is too. We're, we're ready to sign up for the old academic system, which seems to us a lot more reasonable than the Stoic system. Well then, does the young man have your consent, Piso asked me, i.e. Marcus Tullius Cicero, or do you prefer that he learn a system which will leave him knowing nothing when he's mastered it? And Cicero says, I gave him, I give him his head, but are you forgetting that it is quite legitimate for me to bestow my approval on what you've said? After all, who can fail to approve what seems probable? Now, that statement makes it look like the conclusion of the dialogue is that Cicero ends up signing up to the old academic system, not because it's been proven deductively true beyond all shadow of a doubt, nothing, you can't prove anything that way, according to an academic skeptic. But all things considered, when we go through all of these arguments, it seems like the most probably true. And as you learned from Dr. Blythe Green, that is the goal of an academic skeptic in the way that they get through life, is nothing is certain and nothing can be known for sure, but therefore I have to act on the basis of what I think is most probable. And so I think that this picture is the most probable view of what we should call goods and what is necessary for our happiness. And the one that says none of this is relevant and only this category is relevant, and that's the only place that goodness and happiness flows from, um, I reject that as not probably being true. Doesn't seem very uh, convincing. So that's, that's one way to interpret where Cicero ends up. However, the work goes on for quite a long ways after that. Okay, that's, that's sort of what you would expect the conclusion to end up being. And notice that it ends on an odd number uh, book, not an even numbered book. So the structure of the other books is we've had a presentation of the view and then a refutation of it. A presentation of Epicureanism, refutation of Epicureanism, presentation of Stoicism, refutation of Stoicism. Now we have a presentation of this view, and there is no subsequent refutation of it. It looks like there's an acceptance of it as the probably correct view. But Cicero goes on to make an objection to where we've ended up. This is in section 77. Your claim... Piso, on behalf of your school, the old academy or whatever, that all the wise are happy appears to me to be too quick. Somehow or other it slithered by in the course of your speech. But unless the claim is made good, I'm afraid that Theophrastus will be vindicated in his view that no life can be happy if it involves ill fortune, sorrow, or bodily anguish. For it is a violent contradiction for a life to be happy and yet weighed down with many evils. I quite fail to understand how this position is coherent. And Pisa says, what then, what is it then that you take issue with, that virtue has such a power that it's sufficient in itself for a happy life? Or if you accept this, do you deny that those who possess virtue can be happy even when suffering certain evils? And Cicero replies, I wish to attribute the greatest possible power to virtue. Let us leave the question of just how much for another equation, for another occasion. For now, the question is whether virtue's power could be so great if anything outside of virtue is counted as a good. So what Piso has done is said, all of these things are goods, and we have to continue using the term good. And uh, good for all of them, but virtue and these things that have to do with reason is really way more important than them, really outweighs them. Yes, they're kind of important, but this really outweighs them. And if somebody has these, they're basically, yeah, they're, they're going to be happy. That's, that's a, it's basically sufficient for them to be happy, 
But I'll admit that these other things are good. And Cicero says, if you admit these other things are good, then you admit that their contraries are evil. If their contraries are evil, then even if you have goods in these categories, they will have to be balanced against evils in the other categories. And so therefore, your wise and virtuous person can end up being miserable and unhappy if he or she lacks a sufficient number of goods in these categories. And similarly, your scoundrel who's actually morally vicious and stupid, as long as he or she has a lot of these other kinds of goods in a sufficient quantity, since they are goods, yes, they're lacking some goods from this category, but they, they're so rich, they're so famous, they're so powerful, they're so beautiful, that even though they're kind of um, not fully virtuous, they might still be considered happy. And so Cicero does not think that that remains a coherent position. Okay, and he restates the dilemma in a very direct way. Here, Piso says, oh, so you're in agreement with Theophrastus' view that one needs some modicum of good luck and, and good health and uh, integrity of your limbs and everything in order to be happy? Are you, are you signing up for that point? And he says, we're wandering from the point. To cut a long story short, Piso, I'm in agreement so long as what you classify as evils really are that. Well, do you not think they're evils, Piso asked? Whichever reply I give to this question, I replied, is bound to leave you on the hook. And Piso says, how so? And he says, because if they are evils, then no one afflicted with them will be happy. If they are not evils, then the peripatetic system collapses. It just becomes this, the Stoic system. Again, I can point it out on this diagram. So either you leave these as being, yes, these are goods, again, in which case their opposites are um, evils, and then you cannot assure that the wise person is happy, or you deny that they're actually goods, so that their opposites aren't actually evils and cannot conflict with the happiness and success of the virtuous wise person, but in that case, you conceded to Stoicism and signed up with that, with that view. Okay, so um, here is then Piso's final restatement of his view. This then is our system, which you think inconsistent. Virtue has a kind of heavenly excellence, a divine quality of such power that where it arises in conjunction with the great and utterly glorious deeds that it generates, there can be no misery or sorrow. But there can still be pain and annoyance, and so I would have no hesitation in claiming that all who are wise are happy, but that one person can nevertheless be happier than another. And to that, Cicero says, this position of yours, Piso, is in urgent need of strengthening, but if you, can, if you could defend it, I'll let you steal not just my cousin here, but my own self. Okay, so there we have a kind of rhetorical um, in, you know, exhortation to virtue, descend into saying, no, no, we really think virtue is such a great thing. Um, but it still doesn't get at the issue of whether non-virtue things are truly considered bad. And so he concedes that, no, these non-virtuous things like having to do with pleasure and pain, having to do uh, with wealth and poverty, are relevant. And so somebody that's wise who uh, has good health and has wealth and so forth, we're going to say is happier than somebody who is wise but lacks those goods. And the reason why Cicero says that position is in need of strengthening is, again, because that opens you, makes you now vulnerable to the position that somebody who has a huge amount of these other non-moral goods may be considered happier because now we're comparing happy, happier, happiest, and we have a sort of continuum where somebody with a lot of one kinds of goods could be happier than somebody even who possesses goods of the other category. The Stoics, of course, avoid that altogether. There is no such thing as 
one person being happier than another, you're either happy or you're not, meaning you're either wise and virtuous or you're vicious and foolish. And if you're the latter, there's no way you're happy, and if you're the former, there's no way that you're not happy. And there's a categorical difference, not a continuum on the basis of which we can compare people being happy or unhappy. Now, so that, again, I, I, it, it's not perfectly clear how the dialogue ends and what message is supposed to be taken away. But here's, here's a way to think of it. Two standards for evaluating a moral theory. Okay, I'll define these standards. Descriptive adequacy and normative adequacy. Descriptive adequacy requires that a moral theory say of what is, that it is, and of what is not, that it is not. And normative adequacy requires that the theory says of what should be, that it should be, and of what should not be, that it should not be. Now, the view of the old academy, okay, the one that Piso defends, is descriptively adequate in that it says of what appears to be good, health, health, wealth, freedom from pain, things that we all know and think are good, it says that they really are good. Whereas the view of the Stoics, it says health and wealth aren't good at all. Um, doesn't seem to be a descriptively adequate view. It doesn't really capture how people use this terminology. Further, the Stoic view that the wise man can be happy even while being tortured on the rack doesn't seem descriptively adequate. That seems like a ridiculous claim. On the other hand, the view of the old academy that says that something that should not be considered a good, like wealth, should be considered to be a good, doesn't seem to be normatively adequate. We should have a moral theory that does not include things that are not within your control or are not always productive of goods, should not call them to be goods. And the view that it's not in the power of an agent to be successful, but rather that depends, as Theophrastus holds, on whether they're lucky and whether they're fortunate in life, doesn't seem to be normatively adequate. It shouldn't be the case that I, my happiness depends on things that happen to me instead of what I do. So therefore, the view of the old academy seems more descriptively adequate, while the view of the Stoics seems more normatively adequate. How then do we decide which is better? We would, we would apparently have to decide what's more important, descriptive adequacy or normative adequacy. And I was hoping that I had another slide that went through and, and, and solved this problem and explained it, but I don't. So, what do you think? 